Hello everyone, my name is Gary O'Mealy, and in this video we are going to discuss chemical reactions and the role enzymes play in getting them to happen. So we've mentioned metabolism in a previous video, and what we understand is that there are thousands of different types of chemical reactions happening inside the cells of the body at any given moment. But the idea here is that without the presence of a catalyst, most of these reactions would be so slow that they would actually never actually happen or finish in our lifetime. So the idea here is that uncatalyzed chemical reactions are super duper 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 slow. So if we look at an energy diagram for a metabolic reaction, uh, the idea here is that even a very spontaneous reaction like this one will occur very, very, very slowly. So we know that this reaction is spontaneous because when we compare the energy of the reactants over here on the left side of the diagram to the uh, energy of the products on the right side of the diagram, we see that the energy of the products is less than the energy of the reactants. So this gives us a delta G or a change in free energy that is less than zero. So that is enough to tell us that this reaction is spontaneous. But the important thing to understand here is that a spontaneous reaction is not necessarily a fast reaction. In fact, we're going to learn that this reaction is actually very slow in spite of the fact that it's spontaneous. Now, this reaction would happen very, very, very quickly if the reaction could proceed directly from point A right here to point B right here. But you can clearly use your eyes to see that the progress of the reaction actually goes up in free energy before it comes back down to settle at the free energy of the products. So clearly what's making this reaction so slow is the presence of this big hump right here that prevents us from going directly from A to B. So the quantity of energy that you see labeled here is called the activation energy for this particular reaction. We can think of it as some quantity of energy that has to be attained by the system first. Another way of looking at this is that the reactant molecules must be energized before they can actually be converted to product. So what a catalyst is going to do is speed up this reaction and speed up the whole process by reducing the amount of energy that has to be attained before the uh, reactants can be energized. You can compare the two diagrams here and see that there is a much larger amount of energy that has to be acquired without a catalyst versus a much smaller amount of energy that has to be attained with a catalyst. So the reaction speeds up greatly because it does not take the system nearly as long to come up with a small amount of energy versus coming up with a large amount of energy. So an enzyme is a molecular machine that is found inside of cells that will act as a catalyst for any number of metabolic reactions happening inside of these living systems. Enzymes are almost always going to be proteins, but there are some rare instances in which enzymes are RNA molecules, in which case we call those ribozymes. And when we encounter those in future videos, we will be sure to point them out. So we need to make sure we have a good understanding of what a catalyst does and what a catalyst does not do. A catalyst is going to speed up the rate of a reaction, but it will not change the nature of the reaction and it will not change the nature of the equilibrium for the reaction. All we're doing is speeding up how long it takes for equilibrium to occur. Number two, the catalyst is specific for a particular reaction. You're not going to have an enzyme that catalyzes 50 different types of reactions. Generally, enzymes will catalyze only one kind of reaction and one reaction only. Number three, the catalyst will not be affected by the reaction itself, meaning that theoretically, the enzyme or the catalyst should be able to catalyze many, many, many rounds of the reaction over and over again without any sort of limitation. And number four, this kind of goes hand in hand with this, the catalyst should be able to catalyze reactions indefinitely. In practice, this is not quite true, but for the sake of argument, we can go ahead and assume that it is. So in a later lesson, you're going to learn that a protein's uh, three-dimensional shape is absolutely essential for its proper function. And since enzymes are proteins, this is of course true for enzymes as well. The shape of an enzyme is absolutely essential to how the enzyme catalyzes reactions and how the enzyme does its jobs. 
So the reactants for any kind of enzyme are referred to as substrates. So we're going to see here that the relationship between the shape of the substrate and the shape of the enzyme is a very important relationship indeed. When the enzyme is properly folded into its appropriate shape, the enzyme will have an active site, which you can see shaded here in green, which is by and large going to match the shape of the substrate. It's not going to be a perfect match, but that's not real important right now. So when the substrate binds into the active site, functional groups that belong to the enzyme and to the enzyme's active site will interact with functional groups that are on the substrate, and something about the interaction between these functional groups will allow catalysis to occur and will allow the substrate to be converted into product. Once this transformation has occurred, the products can be released from the active site, and then the enzyme should now be free to uh, bind to a new substrate and catalyze another reaction. What we've just demonstrated is an example of a catabolic reaction where one large complex substrate is converted into two smaller simpler products, but there's no reason why an enzyme can't catalyze an anabolic reaction too. So now let's discuss some of the factors that affect how enzymes do their job. The first one we'll talk about is the concentration of the enzyme itself. We'll also talk about the concentration of substrate. We'll talk about the temperature of the system, and we'll talk about the pH of whatever fluid this reaction is happening in. So if we consider concentration of enzyme, the simplest place to start is to think about a situation in which there is no enzyme and there is no catalyst. So on the y-axis for this graph, we have the amount of product being formed as a function of time on the x-axis. And you can see that we would have to wait a very, very, very long time before any product is formed for an uncatalyzed reaction. So that's what we were saying before. Uncatalyzed chemical reactions in the cell are very, very, very slow. So you'd be waiting a very long time for product to be formed. If we add in an enzyme at a concentration of what we'll arbitrarily call 1x, you can see that we greatly increase the amount of product that's being formed over time, which we can think of as the reaction rate. If we double the amount of enzyme, we should theoretically double the reaction rate. So you can see this graph has uh, quite a bit greater of a slope than what we saw before. And then if we triple the enzyme concentration compared to what we had before, we increase the reaction rate even more. The idea here is that you're thinking of enzymes as machines that turn substrate into product. The more machines you have there, the more product can be formed from your substrate. But there is a limitation to this relationship. This is only going to be true if substrate concentration is very, very, very high, much higher than the concentration of the enzyme. Obviously, if substrate is limiting, meaning that we don't have very much enzyme, then it's not really going to matter how much enzyme you have if there's not very much substrate to begin with. So a couple of ways that enzyme concentration can become relevant in cellular situations. The cell can change the amount of enzyme that is present uh, through mechanisms that we'll talk about in the future, like transcription and translation and then protein degradation. Or, alternatively, the cell can activate or deactivate already existing enzyme with chemical modifications, which are called post-translational modifications. And I imagine we'll be talking about that in the future as well. Okay, let's move on to the concentration of substrate. So for this condition, let's go ahead and assume that enzyme concentration is constant throughout this entire little experiment we're going to do here. So initially, if substrate concentration is zero, then the reaction rate must be zero as well. We can't talk about a quantifiable reaction rate if there is no substrate present that can be turned into product because the way that we are quantifying reaction rate is how much substrate gets converted to product over time. So initially, if we start adding in substrate to the reaction, so we are comparing the reaction rate on the y-axis to the substrate concentration on the x-axis, initially when we start increasing substrate concentration, we start to see what appears to be an exponential increase in reaction rate. So just add in a little bit of substrate and the reaction really starts taking off if the enzyme is present. 
So if we continue to increase substrate concentration, this is going to further enhance the reaction rate since the enzyme starts spending more and more of its time binding the substrate and turning it into product and less and less time milling around and floating around searching for substrate. But we're going to see something very interesting here as we increase substrate concentration even more. As we increase substrate concentration, we eventually get to the point where we no longer see any further increases in reaction rate. We start to see something of a plateau effect. So at this point, we say that the enzyme is saturated and it has reached its maximal velocity or Vmax, the point for this particular concentration of enzyme where adding more substrate really does not make any difference. If you want an illustration of what this looks like, imagine a single enzyme molecule that is completely surrounded by these green substrate molecules. So the idea here is that the enzyme will bind to a substrate, convert it to product, and then immediately bind another substrate because it does not have to spend any time looking for substrate because it's not hard to find substrate because there is so much substrate around, you're, you, you can't... Uh, move or if you're the enzyme you can't move any which way without running into substrate so when substrate concentration is much 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 greater than enzyme concentration the reaction is said to be diffusion limited what this means is that the reaction cannot occur faster than the time it takes for the substrate to move into the active site so that's what I was talking about before the enzyme binds to the substrate converts it to product, and then what's going to determine how long it takes for another reaction to occur is how long it takes for a substrate molecule, a new one, to move into the active site. Okay, so now let's talk about the effect temperature has on enzyme-catalyzed reactions. In a later lesson, you're going to learn all about proteins and protein folding, and you'll learn about the intramolecular forces that hold proteins together and maintain that three-dimensional shape that we said was so important earlier. So we're going to go ahead and mention two of these intramolecular forces now. The first one is going to seem very familiar to you. Hydrogen bonding. So we've had a video previously all about water and hydrogen bonding, so we're about to see how very important that is here again. And then number two, we're going to talk a little bit about ionic bonds, which in the context of protein folding are called salt bridges. So like I said, in an earlier lesson, we learned all about hydrogen bonding and how a single hydrogen bond is not very strong, but hydrogen bonding becomes very strong and very significant when it's employed in a vast network. So proteins use hydrogen bonds between amino acids to hold the shape of the protein together. We can't afford for the protein to fall apart on us. Another thing you learned is that one of the most effective ways to break hydrogen bonds is with a great amount of heat. So that's where we bring in temperature into this whole mess. So what you're looking at here is the relationship between the rate of the reaction, the amount of uh, rea uh, reactant that gets uh, converted to product over time, compared to temperature. So what you can see here is that at very cold temperatures, the substrates are going to have very low kinetic energy, meaning they're moving around very slow, so slow that they're not really likely to encounter enzymes. As you speed the reaction up, you can start to see that the reaction speed, or excuse me, as you increase the temperature, you can start to see the re that the reaction speeds up. But if you increase the temperature too much, you can see the rate of the reaction starts to suffer again. At high temperatures, the substrates have a lot of kinetic energy and they're moving around really fast, so that, that means that those substrates are a lot more likely to encounter enzymes. But the problem here is that at these high temperatures, you're going to break the hydrogen bonds that are holding the protein together, and this results in what we call the denaturation of the enzyme. Denaturation occurs when a protein completely loses its three-dimensional shape, and you're going to see in the future that when a protein loses its shape, it's not very useful anymore. It totally loses its function. So you're going to see here that every enzyme has an optimal temperature that it works at most efficiently. The reaction rate for any particular enzyme is going to be higher when it occurs at that enzyme's optimal temperature. And this temperature is species-dependent. 
For humans like us, this temperature just so happens to be 37 degrees Celsius. And hey, guess what? That's the set point for our core body temperature. Is that not convenient or what? Okay, and then uh, the relationship between pH and reaction rate is actually very similar, as we're going to see here. In the case of the pH's effect on enzyme activity, this is not so much a species-dependent thing. It's more a question of where is that enzyme inside the cell or inside the body. So you'll see what I mean here. Well, first, let's look at this enzyme here called pepsin. Pepsin is a protease enzyme which helps to digest proteins into their constituent amino acids. In the case of pepsin, pepsin is secreted into stomach acid, so it shows its maximal activity at very low, very acidic pH values. What this means is that pepsin will work very well in the stomach acid where it is usually found, but if we were to transfer pepsin into a more neutral pH environment like that of the blood plasma, it would not work very well because you can see here, even when the pH is still very acidic at four, for example, this pepsin is going to have very little activity. Compare that to a different enzyme called trypsin, which is another protease enzyme which catalyzes a very similar reaction to pepsin. It has a pH optimum more around eight, meaning that trypsin is going to be ill-suited to exist in the same space as pepsin. So this brings things kind of full circle to us, talking about the importance of compartmentalization, which we talked about, I think, in the second video in this series. We said that compartmentalization allows different types of physiological processes that would otherwise be incompatible with each other to occur at the same time. So as far as why enzymes have pH preferences, in a future video, you're going to learn more specifically about proteins and amino acids and how proteins come together and how proteins fold. But for now, go ahead and recall that functional groups impart special chemical properties to the organic molecules that contain them. We talked about that in the previous video. So proteins and amino acids contain a lot of amine and carboxyl functional groups. So remember, we said that amine and carboxyl functional groups are electrically charged, but that is dependent on the pH value. Here you can see that both the amine, the NH3, and the carb carboxyl, the COO, are shown as being electrically charged, where the amine is positively charged and the carboxyl is negatively charged. As I said, the charge on these acidic and basic functional groups depends very much on what the current pH is. So if the pH gets too acidic, that carboxyl functional group is going to lose its negative charge and it will become electrically neutral. If the pH becomes too basic, the amine functional group will lose its positive charge and it will become neutral as well. This is important because in addition to hydrogen bonding, salt bridges are another important intramolecular force that helps to hold proteins together and keep their three-dimensional shape. So salt bridges are just ionic bonds between the negatively charged acidic groups and the positively charged basic groups within a protein. And as I said, this attraction between these groups helps to hold the protein together. But if we start mucking with the pH too much and we cause both of these groups to become electrically neutral, then that salt bridge will dissolve because without their electrical charges, there's no longer anything attracting these two groups together. And we run the risk of the whole protein structure falling apart on us. In addition to that, some enzymes' catalytic activity actually depends on the electrical charges of functional groups that are in the active site. So if we change the pH too much, we run the risk of the enzyme no longer being able to catalyze the reaction, not because of a shape change, but because the actual critical inner workings of the active site can no longer do their jobs. So you're gonna see that some enzymes are very, very, very sensitive to pH value. So in the case of both temperature and pH, one of the most common problems that you see when the temperature or the pH gets out of whack 
is that you end up with denaturation of the protein. This is the loss of the folded structure of the protein, and of course, since function is dependent on protein shape, this will cause the protein to completely lose its function. So given everything that we've just uh, talked about, you can now hopefully appreciate the dire importance of homeostasis in maintaining homeostasis not only of body temperature, but of the pH of body fluids like the blood plasma as well. Okay, and then shifting gears to kind of the last little topic here, let's talk about enzyme inhibitors. An inhibitor of any kind is just a small molecule that interferes with a biological process. In the case of enzymes, enzyme inhibitors slow down chemical reactions in the body by interfering with the catalytic activity of the enzyme itself. There are two major types of enzyme inhibitors we want to talk about. The first type are called competitive inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors are structurally very similar to the natural substrate for the enzyme. So you can see in both cases, the natural substrate and the inhibitor kind of have part of the molecule that looks very similar, kind of this triangular shape here. So the enzyme is equally likely to engage the inhibitor as it is the natural substrate. In this illustration, you can see that the enzyme has engaged the natural substrate and if this is the case, then we will get productive catalysis. The natural substrate will be converted to product. But as we said, it's just as likely that the enzyme will engage with the inhibitor first. And if this is the case, then no reaction will occur and the natural substrate will temporarily be blocked from the active site. So we have to then wait for the enzyme to release the inhibitor before we can try again to hopefully get the natural, react, uh, the natural substrate bound again. So what we really lose here is time. The reaction rate for the enzyme slows down greatly because the enzyme is going to be encountering inhibitor just as often as it's going to be encountering natural substrate. So just its very presence, the inhibitor I mean, is going to greatly slow down the reaction rate and make the enzyme not as good at its job. The other type of inhibitor I want to talk about real quick are what are called non-competitive inhibitors. So some enzymes, in addition to their active site, they also have what are called allosteric sites. Allosteric sites are located generally on a portion of the enzyme that is far away from the active site. So a non-competitive inhibitor is not going to bind to the active site, but will bind to the allosteric site instead. And you can hopefully appreciate that the non-competitive inhibitor here doesn't really have to even look like the natural substrate because they're going to be binding to different parts of the enzyme. The idea of how this inhib inhibition works is that when the non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, this causes the whole protein to have a very subtle change in shape. And this change in shape is also going to apply to the active site. And what we see here is that the shape of the active site is no longer the same, and now the natural substrate will no longer fit. So that will slow down the reaction as well. Okay, and then the last thing I want to talk about is cofactors and coenzymes. We talked about both of these very briefly in our video on what humans need to survive. We talked about them as things you have to get from the diet. You don't necessarily get energy out of them, but they are necessary for some metabolic reactions to occur. So in the context of enzymes, some enzymes actually have other requirements besides substrate concentration, temperature, and pH, other optimal conditions like that. A cofactor is a metal cation or a positively charged ion that binds to the active site and helps to aid in catalysis. Some examples of these are iron uh, cations, uh, for, for example, an enzyme called catalase, requires iron in its active site. An enzyme called tyrosinase requires a copper ion in its active site. The carbonic anhydrase enzyme we mentioned before requires zinc as a cofactor. And then pyruvate kinase, an important enzyme in cellular respiration, requires a magnesium ion. Coenzymes, on the other hand, are vitamin derivatives that are necessary for enzyme function as well. We won't get too far into this, but we actually did mention a coenzyme before, vitamin C, 
which is necessary for the function of two different enzymes called lysyl hydroxylase and prolyl hydroxylase which are which are both integral for proper collagen synthesis and we saw before that when a person does not get enough vitamin c collagen synthesis starts to suffer and they run the risk of developing scurvy so that's going to pretty much do it for this video here is a list of vocabulary terms i think you ought to know after watching this video and then for checking your understanding number one how do enzymes speed up reactions number two what four factors affect the speed of a reaction in the body number three how can a protein become denatured number four what is the relationship between enzyme inhibitors and the pharmaceutical industry so that's going to do it if you have any questions go ahead and drop them in the comments section and i will see you next time so long